Hi, how you doing? Uh, welcome to my Computers and Society class. Um, we're really pleased to have uh, Tim Westergren from Pandora uh, speak today. He's the first in a series of a few big speakers we'll have later this semester. I'll send out announcements. Likely speakers will be Lawrence Lessig, uh, Douglas Rushkoff, and John Perry Barlow, and I'm working on a few others. <clears throat> So uh, most of you probably use Pandora.com. I know I certainly do. Um, Tim founded the company. He's got a really interesting story. Um, you know, typical entrepreneur that's you know been through the fire a couple of times, uh, from the internet bubble popping to, uh, from what I understand, some eviction notices um, and other challenges along the way. His latest challenge is coming from negotiations with the RIAA, everyone's favorite organization. And um, he's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I just wanted to say a few things. Tim's also a great guy. He, uh, when I met him to talk about coming to speak to this class, I was teaching a class um, of secondary school age musicians who we were teaching to program uh, computers to make music. And I asked him to speak to the class, and he generously said yes. And uh, when he opened up his laptop, you know, so this is just spontaneously, he agreed to speak to a group of a dozen um, teenage kids, essentially. <clears throat> when he opened up his laptop, I saw that he had Wynton Marsalis radio on Pandora. I said, oh, you're a Wynton Marsalis fan, and you made a station? And he said, actually, no, I just had lunch with Wynton, and he created the station for me. So I thought it was really cool <laughs> that he was so generous with his time that he'd come straight from Wynton Marsalis to speak to a group of teenage kids. And when I asked him to uh, recommend some reading for my students for this class, his response was, as much as I'd like to get revenge on all the professors who assigned me reading, why don't you just give them the day off? <laughs> so I actually gave my students, sort of gave the students the day off. Um, so anyway, I'd like to introduce uh, Tim Westman, founder of Tindora, entrepreneur, musician, and all-around cool guy. That would make me sound like a name dropper, which I'm really not, I promise. I was actually quite starstruck having, having lunch with Winton, who is a terrific guy and a uh, real champion of jazz and music. And, Someone that we're hoping through Pandora can kind of we can sort of amplify the stuff that he's doing. Um, so uh, I think Evan and I kind of agreed that the maybe a good thing to do this afternoon. I'm sorry for keeping you inside. I feel really guilty, even when it's like outside right now. Um, but just to uh, tell you uh, the story of the company um, and encourage you at any point as I'm talking to ask questions of any kind. Uh, don't don't wait for me to finish. Um, just raise your hand or start talking and I'll stop. Um, I mean, that's not a good habit to encourage. So, yeah, just raise your hand uh, and I'll, I'll happily sort of digress into um, any topic that you guys are interested in. And I'm guessing based on the kind of pretty broad nature of the class that you have different interests in you know, Pandora or the digital music space and, and I can try my best to answer you know, anything that is of interest to you. So don't be shy about that. Um, so uh, I'm a musician. Um, I, uh, I went to college in California at Stanford, and I graduated in 1988. Um, I didn't major in music at Stanford. The only uh, track for music majors was uh, classical music, which wasn't my passion. I'm, I'm really much more of a jazz and rock fan. So I, I didn't major. I majored in poli sci as an undergrad, which is Stanford's shortest major. So you can major in poli sci by accident at Stanford. It's kind of a thing. Um, and the beauty of that was it allowed me to do a lot of things. So I didn't have a lot of course requirements. Um, I was able to really experiment and, and do everything from creative writing to music and getting involved with computers and sound creation and, and uh, really kind of experiment. Because I had no idea what I wanted to do when I got out of college. Um, and uh, I, I knew I wanted to be involved in music uh, when I graduated, but really didn't know how I was going to do that, um, how I was going to make a living at it. Um, so my first job out of college, I was actually a nanny. Um, a manny, more accurately. <laughs> um, I took care of a couple kids. Uh, it was a job I held for about five years. Uh, kids is another big passion of mine. Um, and uh, it allowed me to do 
uh, music, essentially. I, I just took care of them in the afternoon and made dinner for the family every day. And uh, the rest of the time I spent you know, in the woodshed uh, playing piano and learning about technology and, and, and eventually also kind of watching this rising tide of digital and web uh, businesses that began to sprout up in the mid and late 90s. Um, and I was living in San Francisco, which was kind of the hub, or one of the hubs of innovation and, and entrepreneurship uh, in the whole music space. Um, and through my 20s, I was, I was composing. I had a small recording studio at home. Um, I wrote film scores for a while. Uh, just kind of wore a bunch of different hats. And those collective experiences eventually inspired the idea that has eventually become Pandora called the Music Genome Project, uh, which is uh, this enormous taxonomy that uh, we've been working on for the last nine years and that powers the playlisting system. And I just want to tell you a little bit about that to give some context. So this picture up on the screen behind me is uh, what it looks like at Pandora's offices. Um, we've actually, this is, this is a slightly old picture. We've since grown. There are now about 50 of these uh, employees at, at Pandora who are uh, trained musicians. And uh, their position is one of music analysts. And uh, their job is to listen to songs uh, one at a time and analyze them musicologically along close to 400 dimensions per song. So do this very, very deliberate, uh, painstaking, uh, manual process of capturing every or a very large number of uh, musical details for each song, every dimension of melody and harmony and rhythm and instrumentation, and, uh, vocal performance and vocal harmony and so on, and actually uh, codify that through this system. And so when they uh, log in in the morning, uh, they pop in a CD, and uh, this I can't put on video. You mind? Um, sorry. Uh, they, they, they pop this in. Um, and uh, begin their music analysis. And they enter uh, these attributes. This is one of seven pages of musical detail that uh, they capture for every song. So they go through and score each one of these attributes. And I'm guessing there are probably a fair number of musicians in the audience here. Um, these are all kind of musical uh, elements that collectively give a song its sound. So, on the left-hand column here, those dozen or so attributes are all dedicated to understanding just the melody of the song. So whatever kind of melody you have, whether it's a, um, some kind of drone, a sort of very monophonic, narrow uh, melody, or it's some sort of uh, very acrobatic, melismatic R&B uh, performance, can be understood as some combination of these sort of primary colors in a way. And we've taken this approach and applied it across the entire um, uh, sort of musical palette of a song. And so the analysts um, do that song by song. And when they're done, each song has the equivalent of a musical fingerprint that gets stored in this database and forms the foundation for Pandora. So when you go to Pandora and type in a song, um, what actually happens is a mathematical algorithm takes over, looks at that song's musical DNA, and literally calculates its proximity to um, every other song in our collection, and then starts sequencing those songs based on you know, being in the musical, same musical neighborhood. Um, and then as you listen to the stations, you can thumb the songs up or down uh, based on whether you like them or not. And what that done is it, it does is it um, recalibrates the algorithm that does the matching. So it, it, um, it's kind of learning, essentially. It's, it's meant to sort of replicate the conversation you might have with a friend of yours who's you know, the, your go-to person for music recommendations. And, the more they know about you, the more they know about the songs you like and the albums and artists, the better they get at recommending music to you because they learn kind of what things turn you on about music. And my guess is that you can all sort of do that for your friends to, to a greater or lesser degree, that you kind of know who's going to like what. And what you're really doing is some version of this, just probably a lot less uh, than 400 attributes uh, you know, per song. Um, and so this is the foundation for Pandora. It's what powers the playlists. Um, and it is obviously the sort of center focus of our company. Um, 
it hasn't always been what what Pandora. Uh, we have not always been Pandora name. Yeah. I'm sorry. Quick question. Yeah. Sure. Do you use the feedback uh, to maybe adjust your levels of proximity? If 99% of people say, why did you play that? Can you maybe rework it? Yeah. So. When you give a thumb up or down to a song, it, it has two effects. One is to actually curate that station for you. So as soon as you give that thumb, the song that was going to play next uh, changes. But just for you and just for that station. It's also, though, collected and added to the aggregate sort of um, thumbs that have been given for that song on that station. So let's say all of you have launched a station with the Beatles. Um, and every time we play a song from, uh, you know, uh, the Rolling Stones on that Beatles station, you uh, consistently thumb it down. We'll play that song less often for anybody who launches a beat, that Beatles station. So it's like contextual feedback. It's sort of contextual collaborative filtering. Collaborative filtering is sort of a, a, a term of art for all the systems that use sort of pattern recognition and that kind of what Amazon really pioneered, the people who bought this also bought this, uh, just kind of kind of match you up with similar, people of similar taste and, and refining it, so, yeah. Did you, did you pit one uh, musicologist against another? Like, do you have to check the <laughs> Yeah, that's another good question. Uh, we do about 10% of the songs twice um, in order to keep the rating consistent. Um, and uh, one of the challenges when you do a system like this, of course, is, is how do you get 50 people to have the exact same understanding of how much vibrato um, Mariah Carey has on a scale of 1 to 10? Sometimes it's an ultimately subjective determination anyway. It is unless you train somebody and just beat the individuality out of them. <laughs> so they become part of this sort of monolithic uh, anal analysis system, which is what we do. Um, it takes us a couple hundred hours to depersonalize someone, um, but we've mastered the art. Um, and so you'd actually be amazed if we put like five analysts up here and had them do a real-time analysis for the same song, you'd be amazed at how accurate their, their scores are. And one of the things that we did when we first designed this genome was uh, we, so we created a template and began analyzing songs. So we, we sort of built the first version, analyzed a bunch of songs, and then matched it in an Excel spreadsheet, actually. We had a, little, uh, a macro in an Excel that did the, this, this, this uh, uh, equation. And um, uh, one of the things we were looking for was in the analysis process, uh, could we all agree on what the scores were? And, and one, of the, one of the criteria for keeping a gene or these musical attributes was our ability to do that. So there were some L, uh, attributes that didn't survive because we just couldn't create an objective reference point for them. Um, and it's interesting, if we did a little experiment right now and I gave all of you a little sheet of paper and I put a song over the loudspeaker and asked you to do an analysis of a song, um, you guys would be all over the map on every attribute. There'd be no consensus. There wouldn't even be like a bell curve where you could say, oh, that's kind of the center point. It would just be smeared uh, across all the scores because everybody has a different point of reference. So a lot of time went into doing that. Um, and we iterated on that genome uh, five or six times before deciding, OK, this is sort of the, the best that we think it can be right now and launched off into this uh, analysis process, um, which now has um, uh, um, uh, well over half a million songs. Um, and we add about 13,000 new songs a month. Um, so we're cranking through a lot of music. Um, and it's, someone said the other day it's, it's a couple million hours have been put into this analysis. And these folks do it like somewhere between 20 and 25 hours a week, which is about how long you can do it without going insane <laughs> or wearing your ears out, because uh, the ears do fatigue. But these are well-trained musicians. I mean, all these folks have a degree in music theory. You need that kind of background in order to really both be able to understand this and also be able to do it quickly, because these are folks who can you know, hear a song and pick out everything. Like, is the hi-hat open or closed? You know, is the, What's the kick drum pattern? And, and these are folks that they could listen to eight bars of music and, and reel off for you everything that happened in those eight bars, including they could chart it for you. Um, 
so do the chord changes. Um, a lot of people have perfect pitch. There's a, it's a real high caliber group of people, and as you know, probably wouldn't surprise you to know that that you know, musicians are underemployed, um, and so you get very very talented people for whom this is like a dream job. Um, I would have given my right arm for this job back when I was living on ramen in my 20s, um, you know, playing in bands. And so great sort of pool of very talented people to do this. Um, so uh, that's sort of the engine that drives Pandora. Um, just a little bit about kind of these, these last few years. Uh, so we launched in, in, uh, in the beginning of 2000. Um, and I had the idea for this uh, and was just sort of sitting on the idea, thinking, "Wow, this is kind of a cool thing. I can sort of I'll, I'll take this music genome that I have in my head that I've sort of informally developed as a musician and a film composer, and like codify it and using the web, using technology, build a recommendation tool." But it was just an idea, and and a friend of mine said, "You know, hey, why don't you, why don't you start a company with that?" And and I said, "Oh, cool, let's do that." And then the next day we had a company. Um, started writing a business plan went out to raise money, and raised about a million and a half dollars in March of 2000, uh, sort of as seed capital to get going uh, from angel investors. And uh, got a one-room studio apartment in San Francisco and, and began building this thing. Um, as it turns out, like that was probably the most awful time to start a company. Because uh, we, we raised our money on March 8th, and March 28th is when you know, everything went to hell in a handbasket. Uh, in the technology sector. That was when things really fell off a cliff. So we wound up uh, kind of setting sail into a really difficult time for startup companies. Not only because technology had, cons you know, had, had just collapsed, but the music industry as well. So not long after we launched, Napster hit the scene. And it looked like the music industry might you know, perish. Uh, and so really hard to get going. Uh, very hard to raise money. Uh, we wound up a year after we started running out of money, and uh, we're actually um, we were broke for about two and a half years. Didn't take salary for about, about 45 people or so who worked full time or part time for uh, uh, about two and a half years without getting paid. And uh, it's actually illegal in California to hire people and not pay them. Um, but uh, we couldn't afford an attorney to tell us that, so um, that, that defense didn't work when we, went, when we went up against the labor commissioner, but um, we, we survived by, you know, it's cheap to run a company when you don't pay anybody, uh, so we were able to make what little money we had last a long time, and as Evan said, we, had, we faced regular eviction notices, um, we owed everybody and their brother money, um, I think at one point I had like about 11 credit cards maxed out. And uh, it became like just complicated to keep all the due dates in my head and the minimum payments. Um, but eventually, uh, in 2004, managed to finally raise uh, a nine million dollar uh, investment from a, a collection of venture capitalists, and uh, that's when we kind of reinvented our company and went from a um, a. Uh, technology company where we had initially thought we would take this genome and license it out to other people like AOL and Best Buy and Borders and CD Now and all the folks that were selling music and they, you know, the idea being you can use this to help your customers navigate these big catalogs. Uh, went away from that and, and decided to repurpose the company and become a radio service. Um, and there were a handful of things that pushed, pushed us in that direction. Um, partly was the music retail industry you know, really uh, uh, contracting, but also uh, radio has always been the dominant form of music consumption. Um, the average American listens to about 20 hours of music a week, and of that 20 hours, 17 historically is radio, and only three of it is music that you own. So we talk a lot about CDs and iPods, etc., but um, the reality is that most of the time you listen to radio, and I think the reason is because it's easy. Um, there's all sorts of really interesting statistics about you know, uh, people's usage of devices and CD players and CD changers and so on. The average five CD car changer uh, has a two CDs in it. Um, so that means a lot of them are empty. It really means very few of them get refreshed. Um, 
the average, um, for, for iPod owners, they've done studies, longitudinal studies so over time, and found that um, they've tracked radio listening against iPod ownership and found that when you first buy an iPod, for the first three months, your radio listenership drops pretty dramatically. And then after three or four months, it goes back to where it was or slightly above uh, before you bought an iPod. And I'm guessing this audience here is probably like pretty uh, enthusiastic about refreshing their iPods. Or how many people here own an iPod of some kind? <laughs> it's just unbelievable, man. We, I have to say, like that company, what he's done is just extraordinary. Okay, how many of you are tired of what's on your iPod? Oh, so about a third. That's that's actually like fewer than normal. Um, most people have a problem of, you know, fill up your iPod and it's sort of a burst of enthusiasm and then you get sick of it and you don't have time to go back and rip a bunch more CDs or download a bunch more music and, and you have this iPod fatigue. And radio, you know, doesn't have that problem. It has a different problem, which is it's homogeneous and, you know, it's, it's one station broadcasts to lots of people, but it, it refreshes, not a ton, but it refreshes on its own. And all you got to do is turn it on and hit a button and it plays. So um, radio has always been kind of the dominant form of, of music consumption. So we kind of looked at that and said, you know, we've built this song-based analysis system. And what better use of it than to create personalized playlists? Um, yeah. I'm sorry, what was the original product you thought you had? Mm. You talked about you sort of white labeling. And then you came out What was the original product you thought you had? Yeah, the, the original project was, was a database with an, an API layer on top of it that we thought we would license out to oh, other companies. Really yeah, uh -huh, exactly. It was, it was powered by. Um, and we had some deals. We, we had a three-year deal with AOL, and we had a deal with Tower Records and Borders and Best Buy and some other small companies. It, none of it amounted to a lot of revenue, but um, we thought that's where we would sort of live as a company. Um, and then uh, turned our attention to radio. Um, and uh, in um, the fall of 2005, it took us about a, a year to build the, the, the sort of front end, the, the application. And um, in uh, kind of the fall of 2005, we, we launched a, a, a preview first. We actually gave passwords to a couple hundred friends and family uh, and, and access to this password protected site to sort of kick the tires and give us some feedback. And um, within like a week or two, there were 5,000 people that somehow had passwords to the site. <laughs> and our, our supposedly trustworthy friends and family were not supposed to tell anybody about this experiment. So uh, outside of having betrayed us terribly, it, it, it was there was obviously something happening that it would grow so fast so quickly when people weren't even supposed to be using it. And so kind of that was the first hint for us, I think, that we had built something maybe interesting. Um, and uh, we wound up launching it about a month later. So kind of, I think it was sort of October-ish, September. Uh, and initially launched as a paid service. So the, the deal with Pandora, when we went public for the first time, we, got, we could actually go to pandora.com. Uh, it, it cost $3 a month uh, to use a service. And we thought we'd be a subscription business. And you'd get, the deal was you got 10 hours of music for free, and then after 10 hours, you were supposed to give us your credit card to continue. And I, I know everybody here is like, oh, I know how to get around that. Uh, and which what everybody did. They used it for 10 hours, logged off, and came back on as a new user, or erased cookies, or whatever you do to, to get around those things. Um, and so lots of usage, but no MasterCard. Um, and so we went free in November. Um, you have a question? Yeah, just quickly. I know on your older business model, when you made deals with AOL and other places, did you, were they willing to take your product as a black box? Or were they, because they're so big, they wanted to somehow see the kind of recommendations that you were going to give them? Somehow get go deeper, or did you hide all that from them? Yeah, we hid most of it. So they were okay with that? Mm -hmm. What ends up happening in those environments is uh, people do kind of, you know, Pepsi tests. They just run all the recommendation services against each other with lists and just see what, what uh, gives the best results. And, and they have, they never, you know, they, people did ask for access to the genome. We've never given people access beyond what you guys saw today, this or earlier. Um, and they were okay with that. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. Question about uh, the uh, volume uh, of music and uh, kind of like the long tail aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the, the volume of music being created is increasing. Uh, more tools in the hands of more people, more independent artists out there. Um, how do you plan on keeping up with the increased volume and how can you use the existing technology to start to hit things at the longer end of the tail, things that uh, <coughs> one or two off artists that may not be getting a lot of play, but how do you help people find that stuff that uh, isn't kind of in the, the head of the tail? Mm -hmm. So just some interesting things about our collection. So we have about 60,000 artists. We add 13,000 new songs a month, which usually means three or four songs off a given album. That's what we usually start with. Uh, in our collection, 70% of the CDs are from artists who are not signed to a label. So the bulk of what we have, and by, by that I mean you know, major label or some uh, mini major. Um, everybody these days is their own label, but I don't mean that. Um, so the bulk of what we have is independent. And on a spin-weighted basis, so if you actually count the number of spins, song spins, um, a little over 50% of the music is from artists that are not on a label. So the bulk of what we play is, or you know, the slight majority of what we play uh, are artists that are down the tail. Um, we have a couple people whose full-time job is to go looking for music. So they actually spend their days scouring you know, all the places you can imagine on the web to, to find uh, new emerging artists. And there is no prerequisite for getting into Pandora. So uh, people can submit openly. There's an address and information on our website. And we get stuff sent from you know, hobbyists who are you know, some folks that record things in their living room. Uh, and we get you know, unfinished CDRs sent in with track titles written in Sharpie on the CD. And that stuff will go into Pandora if it's good quality. So we do have an editorial voice and a filter, um, but we welcome submissions. So there's a pull and there's also a push. So as Pandora's name is growing, I think visibility is growing, more musicians are hearing about it and you can see it in our office, the number of box goals of you know, bubble wrap envelopes with you know, homemade submissions coming in. Uh, and I think over time, that the percent of our CDs that are from indie artists is only going to grow because the truth is, most music is independent. You know, what, 98% of music is independent, if you really think about it. Um, to your question about you know, the sort of overall production of music, Pandora's objective is not to have everything. You know, we, we actually want to create a really well curated collection of the best stuff we can find and that we can get through with the, with the team of musicians that we have. And that means people get left out. Um, but in, in our experience, I wouldn't say, this may surprise you, but I wouldn't say that our problem now is that we can't keep up. Um, I would say our problem is increasingly becoming finding 13,000 new songs a month that are really worth adding to the genome. Um, and I say that as a musician who thinks there's nothing better you can do with your life than write and record music. And I think it's awesome that people are doing that, and I love getting all the homemade stuff in, and I think it's great. But most of it's not ready for prime time. Um, and we think an important role for Pandora to play is to, um, to make sure that we play quality music. We don't, you know, when we say we, we have a lot of independent music, it's not the fact that it's independent that is important. It's that it's good. And Pandora does not favor m major label music or independent music. We're completely blind to that. Um, and in general, music on labels is better because somebody somewhere whose job it is to you know, make a commitment uh, to an artist spent a lot of time and decided after looking at probably thousands of bands, this is one I want to bet on. So generally a pretty good filter. Um, but we don't want to leave artists out just because they live in a small town somewhere or don't, aren't sophisticated maybe about marketing themselves. Um, yeah? Uh, two questions. Would you say that the majority of the music is uh, English speaking or you know, based on similar notes? Do you feel that there are any genres that are uh, maybe underrepresented? Less? Yeah, so the... <clears throat> 
that's really where my answer to what his question is different, which is on the international front, we're sorely lacking in music. And, and we have um, very deliberately kind of prioritized music based on a US audience, because Pandora is only legal for listeners that are sitting in the United States. So if you're in Japan or Russia or Sweden, you can't listen to Pandora um, legally. Uh, and we actually, um, when we first launched, you could access it from outside the United States. All you need to do is type in a US zip code and pretend to be a US resident. And our most popular zip code for the first year and a half was like, was 90210. <laughs> and, uh, um, but we uh, eventually blocked international listeners. Um, so we wound up really responding to a US audience, which has meant, you know, obviously rock, the whole Western idiom, Latin music, so Spanish and Portuguese speaking music. Um, and we're now plowing into Celtic, Hawaiian, Cajun, and Asian Indian. So uh, our intent is to be comprehensive, and we will eventually have everything from you know Japanese opera to Swedish goth to klezmer to uh, all the African styles, you know, and that is when I think the music genome project starts to spread its wings, you know. So, yeah. The quality issue probably stops starts as part of the internal debate. At what point do you think you could? be willing to automate some of the algorithms that you find for the new gene project. You might you do a two-tiered system that says this is sort of A-level stuff which we've curated, and this is the stuff so that you can just send your stuff in and people want to go dive into the wash paper account. Um, I don't think that we'll ever uh, put up a collection that is not not anal well analyzed. Um, we don't. I, I understand the benefits of that, the scale benefits of it. But one of the most important things I think about who Pandora is is that we really choose carefully, and don't really want to be associated with a collection that maybe half of it's not up to par or it's poorly analyzed. You know. Um, so I, d I doubt that we'd ever go down that route. We've certainly, we certainly keep track of alternatives to human beings, so any kind of machine listening or you know, computer analysis that could actually uh, replace what these folks are doing, although I love employing 50 musicians. Um, uh, the, uh, what we've seen so far is just pales in comparison to what the human ear can do. So all the most sophisticated machine listening out there, even now, is really rudimentary compared to what a trained musician can do. So I, I don't see anything on the horizon right now that would be, you know, lead me to think we'd replace it. Um, did someone have a question on here or no? You didn't. No, I just uh, Oh, yes. Because I'm coming from Colombia, uh -huh. and I just came a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and when you just said that uh, I, used to, I used to have access to the... You were, you were from Beverly Colombia. Hills, too? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And then I, I received a message saying that yeah. I, I wasn't able to I was like, oh. Just made you hate America a little bit more. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was just starting to learn about you. Know, I apologize deeply for that. That's a real. And then, why did it happen? Well, the reason that we aren't legal outside the US is there's no license for it. And we were threatened with lawsuits if we didn't shut down. Um, so uh, we operate, we have a, a license in the US that's granted by the government, a, a federal license that gives us permission to play anything that we want. Uh, it's just one piece of paper that we sign. Um, it's something that we're having issues with right now, but uh, it's the U.S. is the only country that has that. Um, and I think once we figure out the issues in the U.S., we hope to take that as a template and, and then you know walk it all over the world um, and just say, look, we've beaten ourselves silly to negotiate this. Let's just consider kind of a collective bargaining agreement for the world and get, get on with things. You know, I had a really, just a, when we shut people off, this reminded me, um, I got an email from somebody who was from this very small town, I think it was in Serbia maybe, um, and uh, he wrote in saying that he was really heartbroken because um, in his small town, uh, every Saturday night, the town had begun to um, uh, collect at the one nightclub in town for Pandora night. And Pandora would DJ the evening at this one dance club and there were like 400 people in the town they'd all get together for Pandora night and it had become like the social thing that everybody did in this small town 
and you know they were just devastated when Pandora got cut off. You know, we also got cut off to um, the Department of Defense called us and shut us off for all the foreign military bases, including in the field, because in Iraq and Afghanistan, a lot of soldiers are using Pandora on the bases, but they can't use up bandwidth for music. So uh, we, uh, we spoke to DOD officials at one point and I turned it off. <laughs> um, but that was also really tough. I mean, shit, give them some music at least, you know? But um, yeah, in the back. Well, the truth is they're not allowed either. Um, the, there is no existing webcast agreement that has allowed webcasters to broadcast legally outside the U.S. And webcasters take different approaches to that. Some go ahead and then ask for forgiveness. And I can respect that decision. I mean, the, the, I think it's insanity that Pandora can't stream legally into other countries. It's, it does nobody any good. It's, I don't understand this because there are at least 100,000 radios of the You are telling me everything is illegal? That's right. Because these 100,000 perhaps it means a small number of them. Say. Each country has 20 that are all major. And we are talking about major radio stations here that uh, have big corporations. They're not allowed to stream into other countries. Different. Yeah, they're, they, and they're not, they're breaking the law by doing that. And the reason they're breaking the law, and I'm not saying this is like they're bad people, but when you stream into any other country, you need a direct agreement, a, a direct license from every copyright holder on that recording and, and every performing musician has to have given you direct permission to stream country by country for each song you play. And a small number of stations have those direct agreements, but only for usually a small part of the catalog they play. For the most of it, it's unlicensed. Um, and uh, when, when Pandora was streaming outside the US, same thing, so we eventually cut it off. Um, but there's currently no mechanism for companies to get this license that you need. And that's hopefully something that's going to come along, but it's just not there yet. So it, the, I know it seems crazy, but that's the reality. So you're telling me that the PPC Mm -hmm. Yeah. If the BBC.com streams a webcast into another country, it's not legal unless the artist gave them direct permission to do it. And you're right that in the case of terrestrial radio stations. Seven radio stations, which are the main seven radio stations. Yeah. What I'm saying is the truth. Yeah. Yeah. What about for all songs that nobody owns to copyright? Could you at least do that? There's. Yeah, still. You, like what, for example? I don't know. There's got to be like books, right? Whose copyright have you know, expired and no one can use it anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's some, I guess there's some very old recordings who are public domain now right, that have gotten 75 years post-public. Uh, it's, it's, that's a tiny amount of music, and it's, it's stuff recorded in the 1930s, you know? Um, and there really needs to be some reform of the whole copyright issuance. And actually, believe it or not, the U.S. is the most progressive when it comes to that. And if this license, if we can sort it out, it'll be, a, it'll be hopefully a model for other countries. You know, because then you can get with one piece of paper, we have the right to stream everything, including Metallica and the Beatles and all the people that you know have been objecting to it. So, um, yeah. What are the legal issues that stop someone from creating an app that allows independent artists, certainly unsigned artists, from being able to just say, you know, come? Yeah, so if, if you can get artists to sign an agreement with you, they, you, they can waive their right to royalties. They can, give you, they can grant you any rights they want, provided they own the, the, uh, uh, the rights to do it. Um, but uh, absent that agreement, uh, if, if, we played, if you have a band and we played your music, even if you were perfectly fine not being paid and you could you'd let us rewind your music, whatever, we have to pay 
money to Sound Exchange. That's the law. And Sound Exchange, which is the company that collects this royalty, splits that money 50% to the artist and 50% to the label, which is actually pretty good in the scheme of things because artists don't generally get that kind of a piece of the pie. Um, so we're that's sort of like the, for for Pandora right now. I think the biggest hurdle is really solving this. But um, when we launched in November of 2005, just to kind of get back to that point in the story, like it just took off. We're 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 well over 16 million registered listeners now, and we add about 40,000 new registered listeners a day, um, all entirely by word of mouth, because um, we don't do any advertising for Pandora. It's all people telling each other. Um, we do a little bit of what's called search engine marketing. So we buy keywords on a handful of search engines, but more or less, it's all just viral. And that's sort of the beauty of the web these days, is if you can create a product that people like and want to talk about, you just like let it go. And it kind of develops a life of its own. Yeah. We, we want Pandora to be uh, your radio no matter where you are. And that you buy music from it is great, but is not key to our business. It's something that we think is really important because it's valuable to musicians. And we want to make that as easy as possible and, and really kind of cultivate that behavior on Pandora, which we don't, don't do all that well yet. Um, but it's not an important economic piece of our of our business, because there's not that much money to be made as a retailer of digital content. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, not to be uh, negative, <laughs> there's under some pressure right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's say the whole radio thing, you know, it goes completely out of full plug. The only idea is what you do with genome past that. I don't really think about that. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I'm, I'm, so let's say, cautiously optimistic that we're going to figure this out. I mean, the reality is uh, nobody stands to gain by webcasting not finding an answer, including rights holders, you know, the, the, the large labels included. And so it makes for a bruising negotiation, but I think that, you know, we'll eventually figure something out. And if, if we reach another point of, you know, when things are, are looking bad, you guys will get an email from us asking you to call your congressional representative, which is, has been kind of our salvation. Yeah. So did you ever answer in the uh, blog post about Apple to this thing? There's some bands that are more very flattered by Apple Times and credit or something that's been around for a while. Um, no, and we didn't engage in that. A lot of people thought that was Pandora doing it. Um, <laughs> But no, uh, I, I think it's great that they have it. I can't believe it took them so long. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, I think they're going to see, that's going to drive a lot of sales on iTunes. Um, so there was a bunch of rumors around that, but you know, we didn't participate. We're going to keep out of that stuff. In the negotiations that are going on, who are the various parties? Who are the various stakeholders? Um, two sort of. The two sides of the table are webcasters, so Pandora Live 365, Yahoo LaunchCast, AOL Radio, um, and a bunch of sort of medium-sized webcasters. And on the other side are uh, major labels, uh, independent labels, and artists. And those three groups are uh, under this umbrella of sound exchange, and each have sort of a third of the voting power. So. They have disagreements about what should happen here, which is one of the interesting dynamics that, you know, if you think about internet radio, like Pandora plays 55%, let's call it, of its music is independent. Well, if you're an independent label, you want that kind of radio to survive and grow because on the radio that exists right now, you're, you're maybe 5 or 6% of the playlists. So kind of slightly different agendas. Um, but those are the two basic, that's the division that's across the table. Um, and it's, you know, it's been a long, yeah. Do you think the statutory rate is fair? And do you think that uh, Yahoo and AOL pumped it up to like, knock out the small bit? No, I think the answer is no to both those questions. I, the, the rate that was coughed up by the CRB, the Copyright Royalty Board, which rules this, just made, really made no sense. Um, even a fully monetized internet radio service, which we're kind of on our way to being, would be contributing a huge percentage of its revenue, a far higher percentage than say satellite does. And broadcast radio, with whom we compete more and more directly, uh, doesn't pay any performance fee at all. So you have this very strange situation where, you know, if you're in your car and you're on you're listening to Pandora on the iPhone, 
which you can do with a little, you know, $2 adapter, just plug it right in and you have personal radio in the car. Um, if you listen to that, about 70% of the gross revenue is being paid to sound exchange. If you listen to XM or Sirius in your car, 7.5%. If you listen to broadcast radio, nada. And to a consumer, those kind of all look like radio. But there's this odd kind of anachronistic rate structure that means that these three radio stations get treated very differently. And it's in a massive disadvantage for internet radio. So you know, part of the, the real thrust of our argument here and what we really want is something closer to parity with other forms of radio. We, we believe in paying royalties. We think everybody should. But um, there ought to be some, some sort of resemblance across the different forms of radio. Yeah. So I don't, I don't mean to pry too much into the numbers, but you say it's 70 percent versus like seven percent. Was that in terms of gross, rather than? So, 2008, Pandora is projected to do about 22 million dollars of revenue. We're going to pay 17 million of that in just the performance fee if we pay the CRB rate that was published. Um, and if you back away from the percent of revenue and talk about on how much you pay per hour of streaming. Satellite radio pays about 1.6 cents an hour. Uh, by the end of the CRB rate, we'd be paying close to three. So there's just no sense in it. It doesn't make sense. We'd happily take the satellite rate, <laughs> the deal they got. But we're being stuck with this sort of unfair negotiation, essentially. Yeah. It, it seems like it, it's, it's uh, relative to the amount of bandwidth and volume that, and the level of interactivity you have. Whereas you know, on the radio, you have really zero interactivity and only so many slots a day for songs, which eventually have the same like 20 songs. You guys have infinitely more number of channels, and you just have a lot more customized. So it's a, it's a good question, and I think what uh, w one of the one of the um, uh, sort of ce central focuses of the negotiation is the difference between services that are um, promotional versus services that are substitutional. And if you look at how much uh, the license costs or how much people charge for services, they generally reflect where on that spectrum your company falls. So. If you are broadcast radio, there's absolutely zero interactivity, it's free. If you have a subscription business like Rhapsody, you can listen to a song on demand anytime, which is sort of the, the as close as you can get to purchasing stuff. You're probably not buying very much music because you have access to this all the time. It's completely substitutional. In other words, you do that in lieu of buying CDs. So you're substituting that for CD purchasing. Very expensive, 15 bucks a month, expensive licensing. Um, and so the big debate on internet radio is where does it fall on that spectrum? And there have been a lot of studies then, and we've done our own studies, and I've offered to fund any study the labels want us to do that shows that people buy a lot more music when they use internet radio. In fact, 40% of people that use Pandora are buying more music since they started using it, and only 1% are buying less. And we'll, we'll, we'll run that study any day of the week. Um, and so it's undeniably promotional. Because fundamentally, you can't predictably hear a song on Pandora. You, know, you, can, you certainly can drive it down a certain genre, but you don't know when or if songs are going to play, even from the artist that you seated the station with. So um, the, the, the notion that somehow we should be paying more, there's really no basis for that. In, in fact, I'd say we should be paying less. We're driving a lot more sales. It's much more beneficial, so why should we be penalized for that? It's sort of the, that's how we think about it. But you're, it's a good point you bring up. Yeah. Um, and one, one sort of last uh, thing I'll talk about is um, uh, the whole uh, anytime, anywhere dimension of radio. Um, and uh, our objective as a company is to be the world's largest radio station. We want to have a billion listeners um, that listen to Pandora at work, at home, in the car. Uh, on an airplane, on the train, when you're jogging, you name it. So we're really focused a lot on ubiquity and making Pandora accessible through different devices.
And we've been on AT&T and Sprint for a while, um, where you can actually sign up for Pandora and he- listen to it through a streaming cell phone service. But it hasn't had much in the way of uh, customers because it costs money. Uh, Sprint is $3 and uh, AT&T is 8 a month. Um, and that's a huge hurdle because people don't really like to pay for radio. And for the first time a few months ago, we were able to launch Pandora as a free application on an iPhone. And iPhone now accounts for 10% of our overall listenership on a daily basis within a couple months. And we have well over a million people that have downloaded it and are using it on the iPhone. And I think I mentioned this earlier, you know, this is a car radio now. And uh, if anybody has an iPhone, I encourage you to, how many people have owned the new iPhone? Okay. How many of you have downloaded Pandora? All right. Um, so you may have used it in your car, but plug this into your car and then just drive around. And it, it is a very strange experience because when you're in your car, first of all, you're often used to not being able to get music, period, right? To find a song mixed in with the advertising is a bit of a challenge. Um, you're also hard pressed to find music that suits your taste because it's not, it's playing a pretty narrow range of music. And, and then you're also not used to being able to influence the radio at all. So when you plug this in, I did this myself. Uh, I did it on, on a Sprint phone a little while ago. I don't drive a car much, so it took me a little while to actually experience it. Um, but I remember I was driving my car and I had the phone right there and it was playing and I was thinking, wow, this is a pretty good radio station. Like, all right, that's right. It's personalized, so it's, it knows who I am and it's playing for me. And then a song came along that I didn't like, and I, I thumbed it down. And it skipped, and the next song played. And I had kind of this weird sort of, you know, uh, like cognitive dissonant moment. Because I was in a car, and I just like skipped a song on the radio. Like, when's the last time you skipped a song on a broadcast radio station? Um, and in and, and that moment, I really I f- felt like I got a glimpse of what radio is going to be like and it's going to be personalized, you're going to have it anywhere you want, and it's going to be responsive, you'll be able to talk to it and curate it. And it is really a fundamentally, it's hard I think overstate how fundamentally that's going to alter the music, everything about music. Because we experience music right now in the form of a broadcast. And broadcast is by definition one playlist streamed to half a million people that is, tar- is, is designed to purely attract the largest number of advertisers that it can. That's, you know, if you talk to the guy, you know, the Mays uh, family that runs Clear Channel, they'll say, we are an advertising company, not a radio company. And I, that's the truth. Music attracts advertising. Fundamentally, they're ad-selling machines. You have 3,000 ad salespeople in the US alone who go out and sell advertising. And that's the business they're in. When you can personalize, it kind of turns everything upside down and says, no, you've got to actually nail the music taste of each listener so well that they'll tolerate your advertising. And it's just a different equation. And I think it's going to mean a lot of things, not the least of which a much broader, deeper uh, amount of music getting exposed to a mass audience. And that's really, for me, kind of what is most exciting about this whole thing. I mean, in five years, I don't think we're going to recognize the music industry. Yeah. Can you talk about that, your, your revenue in terms of advertising? Uh, what I mean, what our numbers are, you mean? Or? Yeah, well, I guess Google, Google may have meant by customizing searches for you know, niche mm-hmm. AdWords and that kind of thing. Do you foresee that is, is it possible to do that kind of thing with your genome? Yeah, we're going, ads already are very targeted to you. So we know your age, your gender, your zip code, and the kind of music you're listening to. And advertisers can decide, using any number of those criteria, some combination, who they want to sell their ads to. So um, uh, we can deliver you know, a car advertisement to women in their 30s and 40s that live in Vermont and like punk music. It's probably a pretty small demographic, but we could, in theory, target it to that. And when you have a GPS, you add a whole layer of really granular geographic targeting to it. And in the long run, that, I think, is the true value of, or the, the advantage of uh, a connected radio, because you really can deliver higher value advertising, which means you can deliver less of it. Um, and 
you know, ultimately that's virtuous, that's kind of a virtuous cycle for everyone because less advertising and it's more relevant to you, i.e. it feels more like content. So you get an advertisement, it's for the movie that lo and behold you really are glad you found out and you got the movie time uh, for the theater down the block. Like, that doesn't really feel like advertising anymore. And as, a, as an advertiser, that's, that's nirvana, you know? And like, it recommended the shampoo that you really needed because of that dandruff problem, you know? <laughs> Actually, we won't know you have dandruff problems, but, you know? Yeah, yeah, in back. I can't hear you, I'm sorry, can you stick Right. Yeah. The way that's going to happen, I think, is you're going to be able to uh, listen to music and know who's performing nearby, because songs don't really have a place of origin so much. We don't have a data field that tells us where the band is from. Um, but you will surely, there will surely be a time when you listen to a song on Pandora, if you thumb it up, it says, you like them, they're playing you know, in Tribeca on Thursday. And as a musician, gosh, I wish that was around when I was playing in bands you know, and playing for far smaller audiences than this uh, with my rock band. So you know, it's an exciting future, I think. Yeah. Do you ever find that there's sort of a disconnect between the form of advertising uh, that Pandora does and what radio has traditionally done? Because it, it is, in some sense, it's kind of odd that there's an expectation that somebody is sitting there sort of looking at a screen because one of the beauties of radio or just listening to music mm -hmm. in general is it can be a, a more passive background experience than, say, watching television. And I don't have any experience with it using it on, on an iPhone in a car, but again, that, that seems like kind of a hard space to just advertise visually. Mm -hmm. You can't expect somebody to keep looking at their yeah. iPhone. And drive off the road. Yeah, you're totally right. In, in a mobile environment, audio ads will take more prominence um, for that reason. Uh, it'll be, I think it'll feel like NPR, you know, that. It'll be more like sponsorships or the next 15 minutes brought to you by, that kind of thing. Um, and the, uh, one of the, um, I think, uh, one of the advantages that Pandora has in this dimension is that people go back to it all the time for reasons having to do with, you know, the thumbs, the skipping, the, the, um, the fact we play so much music you've never heard before, which intrigues you. And so you might minimize it to your tray for a little while, but then you go back to it. And on average, it's a, between seven and eight times an hour people go back to Pandora to do something. And that's the only time we put up an ad. So we don't circulate ads or rotate them when it's, when it's buried. We're actually considering a version of Pandora that will look like an Excel spreadsheet. So you can have it up and look like you're working. But you have Pandora <laughs> point so we can deliver those ads to you. Um, but uh, we're, uh, that's, the, that's actually the real key to our business is the, the level of engagement and interaction um, to the site. But you're right, in a, in a mobile environment, more audio. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about this business, business model. Who do you feel Pandora's like biggest competitors are? Like Last FM, or like another, like AOL Radio, or like even like illegal file sharing? Um, there's a couple ways to think about competition. As far as sort of the, the usage, our competition is terrestrial radio, no doubt about it. We are a tiny, tiny minnow next to broadcast in terms of those 17 hours a week. And so when we think about you know, who we want to take hours away from, that's who it is. Um, that's why it's so important for us to get in the car and all these other places. We're not competing with other internet radio companies. We're all small. You know, we're not stealing from each other at all. Um, uh, that's one d competitive dimension. The second competitive dimension is for advertising money, because in the end, that's ultimately how our business thrives. And in that, we're competing with a lot of people. You know, Facebook and Facebook, Yahoo, and MySpace are frequently on the same advertising plans that we're trying to get. So, not even as a music service, but just as a place that you know, Wendy's and Toyota and McDonald's all want to advertise. Um, 
And it's kind of a, so there's a lot more businesses competing for that that aren't all just purely music. Yeah. But, yeah. So do you have any uh, I guess plans to make the Pandora full-fledged satellite service? Because I know that XM, you know, you can also listen to it online and, you know, stream it. So, I mean, sort of like coming out of the opposite angle. Uh, won't go to satellite, and the reason is that a, um, you know, sa a satellite can only accommodate a certain number of stations. So I think XM has, what, 70, 75, something like that? Or XM Sirius now, right? Maybe 100, 120. Um, and if they want to do more stations, they've got to put more birds in the sky. And those are not cheap. And Pandora streams hundreds of thousands of simultaneous stations. So like. There'd be no like airline traffic if we did stuff on satellites because we'd need so much bandwidth up there. So it's actually not a modality that suits us. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did you patent any part of your process? And have you ever thought about extending it to something else like uh, voice or video? Um, we have patented sort of a handful of things. Um, not really excited about doing other products. Uh, we're kind of we have our hands full just doing music. So we were asked one time when back in we were, when we were struggling a lot. There was a woman who was considering investing, and she asked if if, if we could do a, a genome for husbands. Um, and we thought maybe uh, Match.com, of course, has done that now. But uh, I think you're going to see this approach applied to many, many different products. Uh, I know from, uh, that in San Francisco alone, there's somebody building a wine genome and somebody building an art genome. And there's one other that escapes me right now. But I think that's going to become sort of the new methodology. Are they using your patent? I don't know how they're doing it. But yeah, I mean, it should be nice. I don't know how you sample wine over the web. <laughs> I want to raise an issue here for me. Um, first of all, I want to thank you a lot for Pandora. You've you know, given a lot of power to the music. <laughs> I just hate the copyright holders are doing to you. Know, it's amazing how a relatively small group of people, these elites, these middlemen, can control the whole of society, much to their detriment sometimes. You know, I just hate people and I'm very happy. <laughs> so, but um, I think the people could be given a bit more power. Um, I mean, in this sense, a lot of data analysis companies, and you know, it's fair to say that Pandora is a bit of a data analysis company, mm -hmm. right? People feed a lot of data to these dead, to these companies and see very little out of it. In essence, these are huge black boxes where people put in everything they like. In essence, they like the whole, you know, lifestyle, taste, choices, and everything. But you don't get a lot of control over their own data what they put into the system in the first place. <clears throat> in a sense, people who vote on Pandora when they like or ban music, they're in a sense we're paying Pandora for it, mm -hmm. right? So I think it would be fair to say that, in a sense, you, you're not obliged to release the proprietary data, the genome database that you started off with. But you, you did say that you use people's choices and use them in the aggregate. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so in a sense, I think Pandora users are, you know, have a right to access their data in this manner. So, so for example, I could take my entire profile, my, my musical history that I like or do not like a song. But I should be able to move it to another provider. I'm not saying I want to, I'm not saying, you know. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is it's, it's competition. Competition and people, users should have this freedom and independence. So I'm wondering whether Pandora has, you know, any thoughts in this matter. You know, I've never, I've never. Fee, for example, you know, maybe $50 and I should be able to access my history. I've never actually, no one's ever brought that up quite that way. I think it's a really interesting observation. Um, I have to think about that. Uh, I can't think it's happening with social media now. So is it? I mean, I guess, for, I guess some sites are keeping it, some, some are opening it up. That's the big controversy, right? right. Last time actually has an API. Yeah, um, if music recommendation engine isn't open, that's fine. But I should at least be able to take my data right. and move it to another engine, whether it's on my computer or on the web or somewhere. And, you know, I should be able to move as, as a user. That should be one of my rights. I think that's a perfectly valid comment. Um, thinking about you know. Uh, the, this concept of the value exchange going on between a listener and the service. That uh, Pandora, like, who's, providing, who's providing value to who and how? 
and, and, and so what Pandora does for you is we provide this you know, infinite amount of free listening. Um, and we've spent nine years building this enormous intellectual property for that at a tremendous loss and um, built a very complex um, mathematical engine that is constantly maintained and, and you know, refreshed and so on to make sure that we are delivering to you just what you listen to, just what you want. Um, and that's what we give to you. In order to make that work right, we need information from you or we can't personalize. And, and I think, like, I guess there's two ways to look at it. One, is that a fair trade? Like, are we done? Or is there a, a right that supersedes that that is just one that if I give data, it's mine to give back and to, and to use somewhere else, which are kind of, to me, orthogonal questions in a way that, that just because what you do for us helps us do better for you does that therefore mean that we kind of it's a wash, uh, or should that data be yours to take somewhere else? I don't know. I have to think about that. I think it's an interesting. I don't have like an immediate, you know, no, I'm not giving it to mine now, or yeah, have it. You know, go do what what you will with it. I don't really have a strong opinion about that. It's great that you're willing to think. Oh okay, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I think it's an interesting question. So. Yeah, yeah, sure. One last question. Yeah, I mean, a consequence to that is that if in the data on what you marked is information about the algorithm that, that, that ordered the song. So if everybody gave away all the data on what they marked, yeah, we, we could do a job of uh, partially reconstructing the algorithm that, uh, well, that ordered the song. Just the input data, you're not getting the output. You're not, you're not correlating the input. I know which songs you marked. That means I know which songs Pandora showed you, which means I know something about the decisions Pandora made about right. which songs are similar. Right. No, that's true. I see what you're saying. Well, if I compromise, then would be to say, well, Pandora doesn't have to release the output for the input. See what I'm saying? That's impossible. I don't understand. Okay, that's true. No, no, no. You know, what's your... The, the, there's a lot, I think, of discussion around the intersection of business and uh, you know, profit and loss and you know, the, the realities of, of, of cost and social theory, if you will. And I think that happens in a lot of, of uh, avenues. And I think historically, it's been abused, right? Historically, I'd say the, that trade-off has been um, uh, has not been symmetrical, where you know the company that controls the data uses it to squeeze you, uh, and so I think there's an historic, a historic antipathy towards companies that you're you know giving something to. I remember you know uh, there are companies who built their whole databases off volunteer labor, and then sued people who tried to do that elsewhere. That, that's weird, you know, that's an abuse, I think, of, of, of that, that's not the way that data should or can be, you know, should be used. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I certainly think as a company like Pandora, in the scheme of things, is going to err on the side of, you know, being fair and reasonable, but also protecting our business, you know. Believe me, there are lots of companies around there that just want to stamp us out, you know, for lots of reasons. And so, you know, we, we can bear our teeth, too. And then I think we, we sort of want to uh, protect what we've built, but also really respect, I think, the, both the people are using it and the musicians whose art is going into it and the kind of power it serves in the end. So it's a healthy debate to have, for sure. OK, I think we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank the ACN, the Internet Society of New York, uh, Free Culture, and WIMP for helping sponsor this. Uh, if you want to join the mailing list to hear about more of these talks or any of those four organizations, this will be up front. And I really want to thank Tim. Thank you. Sure.